This episode is sponsored by Squarespace. Go to squarespace.com slash Dominic Noble or follow the link in the video description to get 10% off your first purchase using the code Dominic Noble. More on this later. <sighs> okay. I swear that I tried to go into this with an open mind. Since making my predictions video, I spoke to some people who had had early access to the film, and they seemed optimistic, so I really, really tried to give this film the benefit of the doubt, but if anything, I honestly think this was substantially worse than the trailer made it look. I don't think I've seen an adaptation this bad since Percy Jackson, and you guys know how furious I was about that. Welcome to my Artemis Fowl review, my beautiful watchers. There will be spoilers, and there will be nerd rage. After my last video, a few people got annoyed that I used the director, Kenneth Branagh, as a general representative of the film and all its potential flaws. And that's fair, but I did that because Branagh does appear to have taken a certain amount of ownership of the decision to intentionally veer away from the book. That said, one does have to assume a decent amount of the blame for this mangling still falls on the screenwriters, of which there are four for this particular film. Anyone familiar with the industry will know that having multiple writers can often be a very bad sign, as it's so easy for conflicting visuals and intentions to mess things up. Okay, I usually like to talk about a few positives before I start tearing a film a new one, so, um... Uh... The directing is... fine. There's some very satisfying shot composition, most of the time. I like the aesthetic of the lower element. It was futuristic yet industrial, showing that it maybe wasn't the best place to live, even if it was high-tech, so you can understand why the fairies are kind of resentful about being forced to live exclusively underground. I also got a kick out of the small sci-fi elements, like the handcuffs that have some sort of energy connection to the rails and the floor. That was a good touch. There was at least some effort to do something with Juliet, you know, make her more than just a maid and a semi-ditzy background character. Though that was spoiled a bit by them doing virtually nothing with her later, they gave her this massive build-up in her intro, and then all she does is make people sandwiches and take part in group activities. Shit, I can't even stay positive in the positive section. Screw it, this sucked so much. The story is just as confused and jumbled as I predicted. Despite Colfer and Branna insisting that this was just an adaptation of the first book, there is a ton of later plot points and characters crowbarred in. On top of that, they added in this textbook MacGuffin that didn't feature in any of the books, and twisted the entire story in every character's background and motivations to revolve around this MacGuffin. This is mostly scuttlebutt, but there does seem to be some evidence to suggest that this bloody thing was a super last minute reshoot addition to the plot, and I can believe it. It would certainly explain why no one can seem to decide if they're after it or after the gold from the original plot. And worst of all, I was bang on the money. These damn cowards just couldn't keep Artemis as the villain. He's doing all of this to save Daddy Colin Farrell now. You couldn't come up with a purer motivation for his actions. I was, however, wrong in my prediction that they were going to make some effort to make him closer to the book character once he'd been established as cool and relatable. If anything, the little bugger gets kinder and nicer as the story goes on. He and Holly bond over mutual daddy issues like halfway through the film, and I swear by the end I half expected them to burst into song about how they could overcome anything together with the power of fucking friendship! Remember how Artemis's love for his mother was one of his only genuinely redeeming features in the book? They killed his mother off in this before the story even started in order to justify why Artemis is a bit of a dick to people at school sometimes. I remember a lot of telling us that he's an uber genius early on in the film, but I'll be damned if I can pick out anything in particular that he does later on that shows it. Just as I feared, he has very little agency in his discovery of the Fey Folk. Instead of Artemis showing his colossal intelligence by effortlessly unearthing a secret that has eluded humans for millennia, now his dad already knew about it all, and he just learned about it from him. He also surfs for a hobby, and helps Butler fight in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Who is this lad? I don't know if this is just because he was being played by Josh Gad, and they were really excited to have Olaf in their movie, but Mulch has not only had his role in the story vastly increased, he's also the bloody narrator now. FYI, the framing device in which he's narrating makes absolutely no sense. Apparently by the end of the movie, Mulch has decided to work for Artemis full-time, because fuck every fundamental part of his character in the book, I guess. Artemis sends him to intentionally get himself captured by some sort of human intelligence agency, so he can tell them the entire story, because apparently he believes this will make them less interested in investigating the foul family. 
Whoever they are, they apparently don't have any security whatsoever, because all these fouls needed to rescue him was a tracking device and a helicopter. Mulch is also a giant dwarf in this film, i.e. he's human-sized and not happy about it. I swear, I went back to the book a dozen times looking for some reference to this, because I couldn't believe that they would add in a recurring joke so pointlessly random. Again, despite what people assured us, there really wasn't any reference to Holly's struggles against institutionalized elven sexism. There are female LEP officers as far as the eye can see in this movie. Her struggle is now the pain of her disgraced family name, as apparently her deceased father was the guy who lost the all-important MacGuffin. Which, incidentally, she learns he did on purpose because it wasn't safe in LEP hands anymore, making her bringing it back and undoing what he gave up his reputation and life for kind of fucked up when you think about it. Now, fairies are not humans, so our definition of race does not apply to them. However, seeing as she is often described as having, and I quote, nut brown skin, surely it would have been more appropriate to have cast a woman of colour for this role. Elves are also supposed to be human child sized, but adult human proportions, so I have no idea why so many of them look like children. Honestly, that choice ended up making me extremely uncomfortable to see Mr. Butler beating the piss out of them in the awkward looking fast crank fight scene. It's like someone tried to make a serious version of the end scene from Step Brothers. Foley is in the film, which is a relief because I don't think he featured in any of the trailers. Unfortunately, he seems to be missing the characteristic sass and confidence that came with knowing he was absolutely indispensable to the police science division, so he's kind of just a boring character who's there for you to go, oh my goodness, a centaur doing tech stuff, most unorthodox. The book established Butler as a total badass by repeatedly writing about him single-handedly overcoming what should have been insurmountable odds with his expert martial arts skills. The film established him as a total badass by having Mulch narrate that he is a total badass while showing him walking away from the house carrying a big stick then they never show him fighting Solo once in the entire film. Another masterful example of telling not showing. I believe the butler was Irish born with Asian ancestry in the book. Um, the actor they have playing him is British and I couldn't quite place what accent he was putting on. Um, I also kept waiting for them to give some sort of justification for the white hair and blue contact lenses, but that just never came. It was a stylistic choice, I guess. For some reason, Film Butler doesn't go by the name Butler, even the subtitles use his first name, and apparently if you call him A Butler, he freaks out, which seems random. He gets an extended death scene immediately followed by a grand music swelling resurrection as the filmmakers were apparently very confident we were going to give a shit about a guy who's had zero character development thus far. No mention of the fouls being into organised crime unless I missed it. Uh, Artie the First is outed as an international museum thief after he disappears, much to Artemis' surprise. Then it's revealed that he was just stealing fairy themed stuff to stop the world from hurting itself on its pointy edges. I have no idea where the family money comes from now. Either he's been fencing the less dangerous items or they're just completely unrelated to his job, old money Irish aristocrats. Oh, Judy, Judy, no, Judy, why? First cats, now this. Why do you do these things to yourself, Judy? We love you, and we want you to make better decisions because we love you. There really wasn't any purpose to gender flipping root in the end, besides dragging my poor, poor Dame Judy Dench into this mess. Once again, I really wasn't sure what accent she was supposed to have here. It sounded like it might have been like a gravelly Irish, but I can't say. They gave her a lot of one-liners in this, and some were genuinely funny, like, get the four-leaf clover away from me, but then less than five minutes later, they had her saying, top of the morning to ya, to, to no one. There was no one there. So it was just because... Leprechaun, I guess. As the film super was out on the Arthemis is the villain element of the story, they brought in Opal, an antagonist from a later book, and made Lieutenant Cudgeon a one-dimensional asshole, who you can tell is evil because he's wearing an ascot. Ugh. Fuck that Ascot. However, in my opinion, neither of them had enough screen time or impact on the plot for them to come anywhere near to filling the Artemis-shaped villain holes, so the movie felt somewhat directionless regarding who the heroes are supposed to be fighting. It honestly seems like most of the conflict between Artemis and the LEP could have been avoided with an honest conversation. I regret to announce that the filmmakers appear to have completely misunderstood the workings and purpose of the time freeze. The first time it's used, it freezes time internally, somehow affecting humans and a troll, but not Holly. Then it's deployed over Foul Manor for no apparent reason. The fairies seem perfectly comfortable working in the daytime, so why would they bother trying to hold off the dawn? There's no bio bomb in the story now, so that's not it. Its only conceivable purpose might have been to stop anyone from seeing them, but it utterly fails at that. Because this came out on Disney+, Plus, we got instant access to the deleted scenes, and some of them are a real doozy. I can't believe one of the very, very few book accurate scenes that I noticed in the trailer ended up getting taken out. This would have been, like, the only time we saw Artemis acting even a little like his book counterpart. There 
was also a scene that established that Holly's weapon can change shape, which would have saved me from doing a serious double take when Butler uses it in an already hard to follow fight scene later, and a scene that would have established that Holly has to obey Artemis in his house and Mulch doesn't use magic. But that particular one is followed by an extended joke about Mulch being intimidated by Butler being taller than him, even though he's clearly standing on a window ledge, so mixed feelings about that omission. Some non-adaptation related complaints include the editing being so weird it creates a lot of confusion regarding time. The worst example is, they establish Holly heading into work, then a few scenes later you see Opal arranging to get Kudjin out of prison and back in the LEP, then in the very next sequential scene you see Holly arrive at the precinct and Kudjin is already there, showered and back in full uniform. That middle scene could so easily have been slipped into a much earlier part of the movie, I don't get it. The CGI, while not egregiously bad, does range from at best decent to subpar. I think Josh Gad stretching out his mouth like the monster from It was intentionally made to look horrifying beyond belief. I'm just not sure why. I think it really sums up this adaptation that the big line that the main plot concludes on is I'm Artemis Fowl and I'm a criminal mastermind when they utterly fail to establish him committing any crimes. Reiterating what I said last time a bit, but I cannot overstate how illogical Branner and Disney's fear that audiences wouldn't be able to accept a 12 year old supervillain was. They had a 25 million person focus group proving that was not the case. I can't wrap my head around being oblivious to that. What's really heartbreaking about this is you just know that the execs won't read this as, well shit, we should have been more loyal to the books. They'll choose to see it as, well clearly these books are poison, let's never touch them again. That's why it took 10 years for them to give Percy Jackson another shot. I also feel so bad for Fadir Shaw, unless I'm mistaken this is his acting debut, and taking that into account he did a decent job with what he was given. None of this is this lad's fault, and I really hope he goes on to have a long for Filling career. But yeah, as a movie, Artemis Fowl is an incoherent mess, and as an adaptation, it's an insult. <sighs> you know, I genuinely feel so much better after getting that off my chest. And now, my beautiful watchers, I'm very excited to give you an update on the website that I've been constructing using today's sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace is a revolutionary tool for people wanting to create high quality, professional, and beautiful looking websites with zero programming skills required. They provide a range of templates and a massive amount of customization options that let you make something that's uniquely yours while still being incredibly user friendly for both admin and visitors. Most important thing first, I, uh, I did it. I made a page that is nothing but cat photos. <laughs> In almost as cool news, I also now have a fully interactive Patreon-funded to-do list that links to the completed episodes and lays out what's to come. There's a link in the video description if you would like to check that out and see what's on the horizon. It's been genuinely a lot of fun making this with you guys and hearing all the suggestions you've had for features to include, and like I said, Squarespace has made it super easy to add new things and make changes along the way. If, like me, you've always wanted your own website but have been put off by the daunting tasks of designing and performing maintenance, then Squarespace is the game changer you've been waiting for, and right now they're offering my viewers 10% off their first purchase with them using my link and code. There's lots of other cool features of the service, for example, you can either integrate an existing domain name, or you can purchase it through them, and I am especially appreciative of the 24 hour technical support. So yeah, follow the link in the video description, or go to squarespace.com slash Dominic Noble and use the code Dominic Noble to get started today. Thank you for joining me, my beautiful watchers, and if you're an Artemis Fowl fan, I'm sorry. If you found this rant marginally cathartic, don't forget to show a little love to the channel by commenting, sharing, and giving the like button the old clickeroo. Please take care of yourselves out there, and I will see you soon. Much love and appreciation to my patrons of honor, Shelby Holtz and Sam Cucinotta. Hello again, my beautiful watchers. I just wanted to take this opportunity to give you a quick reminder that there's a wonderful website called Patreon that's been allowing online producers to actually make a living doing what they do, since apparently YouTube's decided that they shouldn't anymore. Basically, they offer the chance to pledge a certain amount of money per month or per video in exchange for various rewards offered by the creator. There's a variety of stuff you can earn by becoming one of my patrons, including early access to all videos and taking part in that survey you see at the start of every Lost in Adaptation episode. That's actually a very important part of the process, as I use it to gauge how much I'm going to need to explain about the book and the film before I start comparing them. If you decide to become a higher level contributor, your name will be added to the credits that you're seeing right now, and you'll be given the option to join my private chat room so you can regularly talk with me and other patrons. If you're keen enough to join the topmost tier of patronage, you'll earn the most coveted of all the rewards, the chance to pick a future adaptation to be reviewed by yours truly. However, if right now you are thinking, 
My goodness, the Dom, I can't do that, for you see, I am of the Fremen, and we use water as currency here on Arrakis. I mean, you can have some if you really want, but I'm not sure how much use you're going to get out of it. Fear not, it would still be a huge help to me if you were to give that like button the old clickeroo, share this episode on social media with perhaps a little recommendation to your friends to check it out, and subscribe if you've not already. It really helps my channel grow and reach new beautiful watchers. I hope you have a most pleasant day, and I will see you in the next episode. With knowing that he was... Breathe better, Dom. It honestly... Hey, 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 absolutely not. <laughs>